Ngā hoe whā ngā iwi o e tonei tēnā koutou katoa. E ngā mana, e ngā reu, e rau rangatira mā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I have greeted uh, the people from the Four Winds, uh, the people who are of this uh, country. Uh, I have paid my respects to the leaders and to the speakers uh, for this conference. I would like to greet also the people of Ngāti Whātua, who, uh, for whom the Māori health, uh, they are the people of this region, uh, and they are the people for whom the Māori Health Unit of the Auckland District Health Board performed this morning's porphyry. It is indeed an honour to address the 2014 Royal Australasian College of Physicians, uh, with its topic of future directions in health. Uh, and this, of course, is your college's premier annual event, particularly important at the close of the college's 75th year of service to medicine. I'd like to thank my hosts in particular, the outgoing RACP President, Associate Professor Les Belaito, incoming President, uh, my sympathies as well, uh, Nicholas Talley, uh, outgoing CEO Jennifer, uh, Dr. Jennifer Alexander, and lead fellow of the Congress, Associate Professor Mark Lane, who reminds me we have met before under different circumstances. My warm congratulations also to the organizers, exhibitors, sponsors, and delegates. Well, it's wonderful to welcome you to our beautiful city of Auckland and to New Zealand, where this Congress is being held for the first time since 2005. This year's Congress features orations and lectures from a number of keynote speakers from New Zealand, including Professor John, Jane Harding, with whom I had the pleasure of working spasmodically when I was Governor General of New Zealand. We were both on the Roads Committee uh, selecting uh, Rhodes Scholars. Also Dr. Richard Heron, Dr. Rhys Jones, Professor Rod Jackson, and Associate Professor Richard King. Well, you've been reminded that uh, over a quarter of a century ago, uh, I conducted an inquiry into medico-legal issues centered on New Zealand's foremost obstetrical and gynecological hospital, the National Women's Hospital. Much to everyone's surprise, the report that I wrote so laboriously all those years ago, before we had easy software and electronic search systems, became influential in changing clinical and ethical practices here and in other parts of the world. No one could have been more surprised than me. My earlier experiences of providing advice to government had been more typical, a polite meeting with the relevant minister and the subsequent filing of the report in the rubbish bin. Of course, as I had no medical training, I was carefully scrutinized by the medical profession and others, and many have tried then and since to find some personal or political agenda Given that my findings were a little embarrassing to many and disastrous for a few, as well as for the patients they had encountered during their many years of research. Such scrutiny is to be expected when a report has any impact on the community, but it misunderstands the role of a judge, which is to examine facts, make impartial findings, and reach a, bal and reach a balanced conclusion. There is no agenda and usually a judge quickly forgets the case he or she has worked on. Sadly, I've been unable to do this as year in and year out my findings are referred to or critiqued, at least in New Zealand. And contrary to my embargo at the time, it is commonly known as the Cartwright Report. Since then, I have changed jobs many times, but most of the time I've remained a judge. I've not often been called on to decide medical or scientific or, scientific or ethical issues, but my notoriety endures, and occasionally, as today, I'm invited to speak to medical audiences, I might add from a basis of absolutely no knowledge of the work that you do, as well as to those concerned with the ethical dimensions of the practice of medicine and law, something I know a little more about. 
My recent experiences as a trial judge in the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia, colloquially known as the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, has involved many ethical issues around trials of mass crimes, as well as some interesting medico-legal dilemmas arising from the age and rapidly deteriorating mental and physical health of very elderly accused. I can't indicate my views of the evidence or of the accused, as the verdict in the current trial is still to be delivered and will emerge in the next few weeks. However, I want to give you a flavour of the sorts of matters a judge faces as part of her day-to-day -day work, albeit in the difficult area of international crimes, trials of mass crimes. But first, a scene setting and a brief reference to the events leading to the charges against, so far, five accused of crimes against humanity, genocide and war crimes. Without discussing the problems that face the court daily, indeed I can say if there's not a crisis a week we feel a bit bored, I can only say that the word extraordinary has never been more aptly applied to a court. The court has two parallel administrative processes, operates in the European civil law system, and has a trial bench comprising three Cambodian, one French, and one New Zealand judge representing both civil and common law systems, with two reserve judges who participate throughout the trial in case one of us drops dead. We operate in three languages, so there is translation of all tr documentation, which runs to millions of pages, into Khmer, English, and French, and in-court uh, interpretation. The court has also introduced a comprehensive system of participation by victims. The factual background is predictably tragic. Many of you will recall something of the period in the 1970s when Cambodia was ruled by the ruthless Khmer Rouge, a Marxist group led by a man called Pol Pot. It is estimated that at least 1.7 million people from a population of more than 7 million died through execution, starvation, disease, or overwork in the three years, eight months, and 20 days of the regime. Khmer Rouge ideology required that the country become self-sufficient, there was to be no conventional economy or formal education and no modern technology. The cities were to be emptied of their inhabitants so the entire population could work in the rice fields or building infrastructure. A reversal of the social order was imposed. Poor peasants were to become the elite and new people or city dwellers, the educated, intellectuals, those who had studied or worked abroad anyone who might oppose the Khmer Rouge ideology were to be eliminated as actual or potential enemies. And by eliminated, uh, actually the word that the Khmer Rouge used was smashed, which meant killed. Ironically, the country was renamed Democratic Kampuchea. After the Khmer Rouge gained control of the capital, Phnom Penh, in April 1975, it forced out at gunpoint approximately two million people, killing anyone who resisted. Families were separated, the elderly, sick and young perished immediately, and many starved or succumbed to illness en route to the rural areas. And it took them only three days to get all of these people out of the city. Once in the rural areas, the survivors were put to work tilling the fields using equipment usually pulled by oxen, planting rice, building canals and dams with their bare hands. Not surprisingly, as the regime consolidated its power, there was a terrible death rate. There have been two trials to date, the first of a man with the revolutionary name of Doik. He is a well-educated, highly intelligent former teacher who excelled academically, particularly in mathematics. Doik was appointed to head S21, one of about 190 similar security prisons scattered throughout Cambodia. Of 12 to, 12 to 20,000 detainees in S21, about five to eight people survived, albeit under constant threat of death. Other detainees were shackled to a common iron bar, toileted on the floor, still shackled, 
fed starvation rations, hosed down, bitten by mosquitoes, and tortured till they confessed, often to being members of the CIA or KGB, or on some rare occasions, both, which was politically unusual. Of course, uh, many of those people had never even heard of these organizations. Uh, many died after torture, but those who survived were put to death in a field near Phnom Penh. Children were killed immediately. Women were interrogated only if they were important before being killed. Friends, relations, and work colleagues, colleagues of all those detained were themselves arrested on the principle that it's best to pull up the rice plant by its roots to avoid later revenge. The terror extended also to the young peasants employed as guards, interrogators, and executioners. One mistake, like falling asleep on the job, and they joined the other detainees. Although most of the detainees were Cambodian, there were a significant number from Vietnam with whom Cambodia was engaged in armed conflict, and some other nationalities, including a few Australians and one New Zealander. All were killed brutally after uh, under torture, they had confessed to spying. The second trial in which the evidence has concluded, uh, and in which I'm engaged in writing the verdict, is of four remaining senior leaders. Kyo Sampon, the head of state, was French educated with publications on economics to his name. Nguyen Chia, a consummate politician, commonly known as brother number two, they're the only two left on trial. They're both in their late 80s and in fragile health. Yeng Sari, perhaps one of the most intelligent and influential of the Khmer Rouge, was an urbane foreign minister and held the Cambodian seat in the United Nations for many years during and after the fall of the regime. He died late last year and his wife Yeng Tirat, who was the social affairs minister, was diagnosed as suffering from advanced dementia, probably Alzheimer's, at the beginning of the trial three years ago and severed from the proceedings. Among the allegations against those four are forced evacuations of the cities, enslaved labor, enforced communal living, forced marriages, and many other inhuman initiatives. The regime was incredibly secretive and no one caught up in it knew who the leaders were, until after the regime fell, and nor did they usually know why they were singled out for punishment or death. It was a nightmare which lasted for almost four years and was suffered in a country later described as one huge concentration camp, killing approximately one quarter of the population. Cambodia has been crippled by these events, leaving a nation with at least two ge generations illiterate or semi-literate, and burdened with severe physical, mental, and psychological trauma. In this context, the victims must be at the forefront of attempts to achieve justice. The role of the victims in the criminal justice system is increasingly under a focus of attention in many countries, and there's a <coughs> very vocal demands to focus more intensely on the experience of the victim with calls for justice or revenge, often made from public platforms from which victims' suffering can be dramatically articulated. Increased prison terms are demanded and harrowing stories are paraded before vast public audiences. I've always doubted that victims thus displayed gain anything positive from the experience of so publicly discussing their tragedies and my recent experience in Cambodia has done nothing to change my mind. At trial, the part played by a victim who gives evidence can be pivotal. In the French civil law system on which the Cambodian judicial system is based, a victim is called a civil party and has the right to participate at all stages of the criminal process in order to assist in the ascertainment of the truth and to seek reparation for injury caused by the offending. Throughout the whole process, the victim may, victim may offer evidence and have access to all the confidential material collated. The system is designed to put the victim in a central position during the criminal trial. This model has been adapted for use by the extraordinary chambers in its trials. For very good reason, 
In Doik's trial, 93 victims participated actively, and in the, trial of the, the current trial of the senior leaders, almost 4,000 victims have been registered. Given that all are entitled to legal representation, in itself a major logistical ex exercise, we have had a major rethink of the way in which the victims can best participate. I want to give you a small profile of the victims of the Khmer Rouge, because one of the features of the Cambodian tragedy is, the, the, is that the events and the people have been examined exhaustively by hosts of scholars, social scientists, psychiatric, psychological, legal, and medical experts. Survivors of the Khmer Rouge regime who have been surveyed ask for a variety of outcomes from these uh, trials, justice, reconciliation, an opportunity to articulate their experiences, sorrow and anger publicly, revenge, or simply to find out what happened to a relation or a friend. A trial attempts to give justice and provide accountability, but it is by no means the perfect process. Choices must be made as to who to indict and try and which charges to bring. At trial, factors such as the availability of relevant evidence, the reliability of witness memories, the fitness of the accused, which dictates the speed at which the trial can proceed, the balancing of the rights of the accused, victims and witnesses, all play a part in determining what can be considered by the judge. Justice is also a subjective concept. For the accused, it's a fair trial, in itself a whole topic with an appropriate sentence if convicted. For the victim, it's to hear all the information about the incident in which he or she was involved. The victim may also hope that there will be an opportunity to confront the accused, to seek information, to assuage suffering, extract a pound of flesh, or tell the world about his suffering. Only some of these objectives can or should be achieved. And reconciliation is very unlikely in the tense atmosphere of a trial. Catharsis may occur, but a trial, even with the full participation of victims, does not and cannot offer therapeutic outcomes. A witness can certainly tell the world about his suffering, but depending on the world's interest in the particular trial, this may be to a limited audience. In a domestic criminal trial, unless there are features which ensure the media will cover it, no one outside the courtroom will listen. At the other extreme, in the extraordinary chambers, the 500 capacity public seating is usually full, and at least in Asia and Europe there is extensive coverage. But I have serious doubts about the therapeutic value to the victim of such wide coverage, and in a few instances, the fact that they would be on television has encouraged a victim with an agenda to give evidence. Conversely, notably in the academic world, it has appeared that publicity has sometimes made those shy, retiring souls, expert witnesses, reluctant to appear. Mainly it appears because they do not want to be challenged publicly concerning their published con conclusions, be they historic, political or legal. Victims also want the opportunity to vent anger and sometimes to threaten revenge. This too is a topic all of its own, but a fair trial is not the venue for this. The desire for revenge is a fundamental human emotion, but it's a court's responsibility to ensure accountability for crimes in an atmosphere that is calm, compassionate and fair. Victims want to know what happened and why. Senior leaders will seldom have the de details that a victim craves. Where you have processed up to 20,000 people through your prison, or led a country of five to seven million enslaved laborers for almost four years, the accused will seldom have the details sought by an individual victim. A parallel process may be helpful, one which involves a wide range of lesser participants who may have more direct information which is useful for a victim who cannot forget or forgive or resolve his emotions. Every victim of a crime wants to be reinstated into the financial position they were before the crime was committed. 
At the extraordinary chambers, for various reasons, reparation is limited. But even if an accused had the massive resources needed, how does one put a price on the loss of an entire family, all of your property, or the uh, opportunity to get an education, for the destruction of mental or physical health? A civil party has full, privileged access to material gathered during investigation and trial. Much is deeply personal and confidential. In Cambodia, while there were many victims who were enslaved or press ganged into service, equally, there were many who voluntarily chose to be perpetrators or effectively had no choice. The Cambodian people soon understood that noble gestures were useless if you refused to become an executioner, then you and your whole family would very likely die. And some who are registered in the trial as victims had their own venal reasons for engaging with the court. So the line between victim and perpetrator is very unclear. And immediately you will see that there were massive ethical issues in protecting confidential information so that witnesses and other participants are kept safe. In employing a model which limits criminal justice to a criminal trial, we may be con confusing the objectives of fair and expeditious trial, which, which at its end imposes a balanced sentence on any person convicted, with a human rights impetus to learn the wider truth of why an event has occurred and to find a resolution that might prevent a recurrence. The absence of a clear line delineating the justice from the human rights objectives can lead to confusion and disappointment. Well, who are these victims? In contemporary Cambodia, there has been a tragedy in every family. Even th more than 35 years after these events, simply chatting to a tuk-tuk driver on the street teaches you this. Early in my time in Cambodia, I spoke to a man whose brother, a doctor, working in the countryside along with thousands of others, saw a young Khmer Rouge soldier fall from a tree and ran to help him. Until then, the doctor had successfully hidden his educated status. The Khmer Rouge guards did not listen to his plea to be allowed to help and shot him, and the young man then died. Many of the victims have had a personal impact on me, including the judges with whom I work and have worked for every day over six years. All of them experienced life under the Khmer Rouge, yet survived to gain a legal education to help lead their country as it struggles to overcome the legacy of those years. They have an enormous responsibility, given that the notion of the independence of the judiciary is not a strong one in Cambodia, and no doubt compromises have had to be made to survive. As one judge said to me, when the foreign ship sails, we have to contend with the ongoing consequences of our work. So I can come home to a comfortable retirement, they cannot. Few, if anyone listening today, will have suffered the terror, deprivation and indignities experienced by the hundreds of victims I have met. So we remember why trials for mass crimes are convened, often well after the events. I'll describe a few of the victims' experiences. Chum Mai survived S21, the prison led by Doik. He was beaten and tortured for 12 days and nights before being assigned to re repair mechanical equipment. When S-21 was evacuated just ahead of the invading Vietnamese, he was marched off, and by some miracle he came across his wife, who had been imprisoned elsewhere. She had with her their only baby, born while in prison. He was able to carry it for a few hours, but soon after, while trying to flee the Khmer Rouge, they were shot at, and his wife and baby died. He said this, Whenever the words S21 or Tool Sling, as it is known locally, prison comes into my mind, I could not hold my tears. It drops automatically. I was told because of the anger of the trauma I suffered during the Khmer Rouge regime that I need to keep my mind free from these feelings. However hard I try, my tears still drop. Nong Champal was only eight when he was taken with his mother and small four-year-old brother to S21. 
He watched terrified as his mother was pushed, threatened and photographed. After a night in a cell with some other women, five children of whom he was the eldest was, were taken to a place behind the kitchens. His mother told him to care for the children. One breastfeeding baby died in spite of him trying to feed it rice gruel. When the Vietnamese came to liberate the city, he hid himself and the surviving children in a pile of clothes, refusing to join the fleeing staff in case his mother couldn't find him. We now know that he was taken to S21 just days before it was evacuated, in the chaos, ex escaping inevitable and immediate killing. His mother was executed in that brief period. While trying to find his mother after the staff had fled, he saw what he thought was a nightmare, dead, bleeding bodies on beds around the prison complex. In the current trial of the senior leaders, a woman who testified as a victim was forced out of the city with her family. As she was struggling among thousands of residents to cross a central city bridge with her children, through the crowds she saw a dead woman with her crying baby crawling over the body. Before the woman could reach the body, the baby, a guard had picked it up, physically torn it apart, and thrown it into the river. Of the medical practitioners caught in the country when the Khmer Rouge closed the borders, the vast majority died, as did the lawyers uh, and judges. Some who were able to hide their education and professions did survive and have written of their experiences. At the fall of Phnom Penh, many were trying desperately to treat the huge numbers of injured due to the, um, uh, the uh, shell shelling of the city for many weeks in advance of the fall of the city. And those doctors and other medical professionals never saw their own families again. They were separated by the estimated two million people being forced out of the city. In the hospitals, ordered out at gunpoint, they had to abandon their patients. And the, uh, one doctor witness described the pleas of a young, badly injured girl whom he could not help medically for lack of supplies and was forced to leave her screaming for him to help her and in pain. He is haunted by her even today, as well as by the fact that he could not find his wife pregnant with their first child and has never seen her again. I have seen photographs of patients being pushed along the road in their hospital beds by medical personnel who, who were either killed or forced to abandon them to die soon after. Witnesses described patients crawling along the road. The patients in a psychiatric hospital were all killed. These people deserve the right to tell their stories, to have at least some of their questions answered and their desire for retribution assuaged. But so far, no mechanism for achieving this has been wholly effective. And the terrible thing that the cry from the Holocaust, survivors, never again, is far from realized. I recognize that much of what I have described is far removed from your worlds of medicine, unless some of you have worked in post-conflict societies, as many Australian and New Zealand doctors continue to do in Cambodia, often at great personal sacrifice. It is same, it's same for the lawyers and judges from our respective countries who work in Cambodia. Those of us who have had that privilege live stimulating and rewarding professional lives, seeing and dealing with many issues that our colleagues, friends and neighbours find amazing. Although most doctors and lawyers work in an environment less dramatic than what I have spoken about this morning, we all, lawyers and doctors, face many domestic, technical, and ethical dilemmas. The skill is to recognize them, to confer with and learn from each other, and to continue to work in what I am inclined to call our respective service industries, to serve our communities professionally and to the best of our abilities. As former New Zealand Health and Disability Commissioner Ron Patterson said, when delivering last year's Arthur Mills oration lecture entitled The Good Doctor, Competent, Fit and Safe, ideally professionalism is a commitment by members of a profession, individually and collectively, to maintain high standards and serve the public in return for the privileges accorded to practitioners. This Congress gives you all a chance to build on your knowledge and skills 
and exchange information with colleagues both in and outside your area of specialty. Your presence today also indicates that you recognize your role, roles as health professionals and specialists in shaping the future directions of our healthcare systems, both in New Zealand and in Australia. At a time when an aging population boosts the prevalence and burden of chronic disease and illness, and therefore places increasing strain on healthcare systems, both our countries are reshaping health budgets and trying to improve targeting and, improvement, uh, targeting and management of resources. Driving better value for rising healthcare expenditure will certainly be a key discussion point for Congress, made more apt a week after both countries produced budgets, always a time of tension for those concerned with the provision of healthcare. Over the next three days, delegates will share and be recognized for their world-class research this reflects the focus the college, through its foundation, maintains on medical research as one of its strategic priorities. When, with ongoing collaboration, the continuing dedication and hard work of research, researchers and donor investment, advances and breakthrough in research that deal with disease and other health priorities will continue to occur. I wish you every success as you confer and enjoy each other's company. And it is now my very great pleasure and privilege to declare this Congress open. Tēnā koutou katoa.